Marcy Frumker from the International Women's Air and Space Museum in Cleveland, Ohio. Good day, Marcy. Nice to be here. Nice to talk to you. And your arrival on the space, space station contributed to women's flight history when you and Tracy Caldwell Dyson became part of the largest group of women serving on a long-duration mission. Uh, in addition, uh, your timing with your launch uh, occurred about 47 years after the first woman mm -hmm. entered space and nearly 27 years after the first U.S. woman in space. So how do you feel about making your own history <laughs> and walking in the footsteps of these historic women who flew before you? Oh, gosh, there's so many emotions that go along with that. Um, it is pretty exciting. It was great uh, being with Tracy up there, and um, it was nice having another female um, because so often uh, there's so so many more men in this in this uh, job than than women. So it's nice to have a have a partner in crime there. But um, you know, in some sense, it's nice to be part of history. And then also, I, I sort of think that well, surely it's time that uh, we need to stop talking about this because women have made so many strides and we're doing so so many different things in the fields of aviation and other uh, aspects in the world that uh, maybe we don't need to talk about it anymore. Okay. Uh, well, one more question on that line. Uh, you were trained for both the space shuttle and the ISS programs, and what do you think has been the impact of the space shuttle program specifically on women astronauts? Oh, the space shuttle uh, program definitely opened the uh, door for, for female astronauts. The first uh, women astronauts were selected as part of the space shuttle program, and so uh, that program was what gave uh, women their start as astronauts. and, and um, and I think it's been very positive because we've been able to do so many different things um, on the shuttle, everything from the mission specialist role to the uh, EVA, uh, the spacewalking astronauts role to uh, 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 pilots and commanders on the, on the space shuttle. And uh, you're a member of the 2004 class of NASA astronauts. How did it happen that you're the only one not to fly on the space shuttle? <laughs> any regrets now that the shuttle is about to sort of fly off into the sunset? Um, regrets, no. I, I, it's kind of bittersweet that I'm not uh, actually going to be able to fly on a space shuttle since so much of my career was shuttle-based. But, um, uh, you know, I was excited. I, when I had the choice of what I wanted to do, I wanted to fly a long-duration uh, um, mission, and so the opportunity was there as um, uh, for me to do that. But in order to do that, I needed to ride round trip on a Soyuz rocket, and that was absolutely fine with me because that is a fantastic little spacecraft. Excellent. And speaking of your stay up on the space station, you performed a lot of robotic works during your stay. Uh, so what's it like to operate the arm during some critical EVAs like you did, and how did your robotics training help you to master those skills? Well, the training um, that we had was very good on the ground in that uh, we trained uh, what we call skills-based training. So I was trained for a wide variety of activities and nothing uh, too specific, um, which is paid off in this case because we did three spacewalks that we had not rehearsed before, and so I hadn't seen, had not seen any of those robotics activities before I did them. Um, it's pretty exciting operating the arm. It's, um, you know, you've got... Uh, real hardware out there. It's not just uh, a simulated hardware like we have on the ground. And uh, having a crewmate on the end of the arm where you're moving him around um, is pretty exciting. It gives you pause of thought. You know, you, you uh, um, want to make sure that you're doing everything to make sure he's safe and that the hardware is safe and that the, the mission is going to be accomplished. So there's a lot going through your mind as uh, you're operating the arm. I can only imagine. <laughs> um, do you think that your background, uh, specifically as a flight controller, gave you special insight uh, in terms of the workings of mission control and dealing with the ammonia pump failure and then the subsequent replacement. Absolutely no question, and not just my background as a flight controller, but uh, a job I had subsequent to that when I was um, working on the engineering side of the house in the in the control center, so I worked with all the engineers that had designed, built, and tested the hardware for the space station, and so I was very, very familiar with the processes and the, the methodologies that they would use to psych out what the problem was, how we go about uh, resolving what needs to be done, and then working with the flight controllers to implement the solutions. And so having that background and having spent so much time in the control center, uh, I was very, very well aware of what was going on on the ground and, and knew that we were in good hands the whole time. Excellent. And uh, our museum is a big advocate of STEM education for young girls. What was your motivation for choosing the STEM pathway, and do you have any advice for young girls with similar interests? Well, my advice to girls with similar interests is don't, don't be put off. Uh, it's very easy to get distracted from uh, what you're interested in uh, when you're going through school, especially in junior high and high school. Um, but if you like it, stick with it. It's definitely worth um, sticking it out. There are so many wonderful careers out 
um, in science and technology um, that that you just have no idea. Um, your world is, is, is so open to you if you can pursue those fields. So um, just be true to what you like and, and pursue it. It's not always easy, but it's, it's definitely worth doing. And as far as for me, my motivation, I always liked it. And so I was always fortunate that uh, I had a family and environment where I could pursue uh, my interests.